Hey everybody, sorry about that, Foley here uh, for the weekly news recap for the 2nd of April to the 9th of April? 8th? 9th or 8th, something like that. Anyway, uh, let's get into it. So, this week uh, Nintendo uh, went through uh, Tears of the Kingdom. <clears throat> so they got an actual look at some gameplay to see how things are going to play out. So we'll just play this so you can have a look at it as I talk over it. I'm going to skip past him, him talking a little bit. Hey Melwen, how's it going? Happy Sunday. Um, so it's kind of showing off that this is the area in and around Julian Peaks, the Julian Peaks stable. Um, it's for the most part much the same, but oh wait a minute, no, maybe it's not. There's something floating up in the air now. And like, how do I get there? It's gonna be a little bit difficult to figure out, but no, there's apparently a lot of different ways you can get there. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead a few of them. Uh, Link has a new rewind ability. He also has a new haircut that um, I'm still thinking this isn't Link, you know? It's just my pet theory is it's Ganon from 10,000 years ago. Um, my pet theory is that whoever kills Ganon becomes Ganon. Or becomes becomes Cal Calamity Ganon in this universe, at least. That's my pet theory. I have nothing to suggest that's true. <laughs> Other than um, when you see the murals uh, where it's depicting, like, however many thousands of years ago that they did this before, uh, it has, you know, Calamity Ganon in front of the castle, and then it has uh, Zelda, or the goddess, on one side, and it has the hero of time on the other side, and it, you know, it looks a whole lot like Ganon. Doesn't look like Link, looks like that. Anyway, these are Sky Islands, uh, or Skylands, as they should have called them, but no, they didn't. Anyway, you can get up here, it has its own um, ecosystem kind of thing. You've got these trees that you're not going to find anywhere else. You've got these ruins you're not going to find anywhere else. So there's some shenanigans. So I think there's some timey-windy shenanigans going on here. Um, but then they show off something that's going to pretty much really, really change how you approach combat. So, like showing off fighting with the branch, things aren't gonna go very well, obviously, because the branch is kind of shit and will break immediately. Um, but if you have a branch, hang on, maybe he does it in the next fight. All right, it's in, the, it's in this fight. So you can, if you come across a big stick and also a big rock, hey, why don't you, why don't you put the rock on the stick and make yourself a big hammer instead? Now. <laughs> this is going to so massively change how games work, or not how games work, but how the Tears of the Kingdom combat is going to be very different to Breath of the Wild. Where you're just going around fusing ever more powerful things. It reminds me of uh, a scene in The Simpsons where Mo has uh, one gun and then he has four other guns attached to it. And he's like, and that's how you turn one gun into five guns. Anyway, so fuse is a new ability uh, and you can fuse pretty much anything. Or I would say it's probably one weapon onto another weapon. It's probably how it works. But this is kind of ridiculous in that he puts a spear shaft and a farmer's pitchfork together and now it has incredible reach. <laughs> that looks hilarious when it's stowed, but like you can stand from like miles away and stab enemies. Like that's insane. That's going to cause. I don't know how many glitches you're going to be able to to cause here. Uh, some other things you can also fuse uh, things onto your arrows. So the Korok Frond's not going to do a whole lot, but you know a white choo choo jelly uh, effectively turns it into a frost arrow. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool, um, but. Probably the more interesting one they show off here is what happens if you fuse an arrow to an eyeball. So you can get an eyeball from Keys, which are the bat type enemies. And this will probably take a lot of difficulty out of hitting birds. Well, birds in particular, but anything that moves really, really fast. Uh, this will make this so much easier. If you have enough eyeballs, you can just graft the eyeball onto the arrow. And it'll just it'll just do it for you. So that's pretty insane. Uh, there were some other things showing off there. It's like meat. Well, okay, I can attach meat to an arrow. What's that going to do? I can attach... 
Well, various animal horns probably just makes the arrow more damaging. Um, can you attach wings onto the arrow and make the arrow fly further or anything like that? Um, here's where they attach a mushroom onto the front of the shield, which might seem dumb. Like, why bother? But, um... Oh, well, I skipped it there. But <laughs> if the enemy hits it while you're shielding, it will uh, throw out a puff cloud. And it's effectively an, uh, a free stealth attack. So there's a lot of... There's going to be a lot of creativity uh, for this kind of stuff. Um, but the fuse isn't just relegated to uh, weapons. You can also um, combine multiple <laughs> multiple things together, uh, but you can also uh, combine things to make um, vehicles. And the trailer that was shown before this showed Link on it like a bunch of flying vehicles and a big car and a bunch of other stuff. Um, none of those are actually present in the game. They're just created um, by just by sticking things together. So they like Tears of the Kingdom is is now Lego. It's this is this is Lego Zelda. This is about as close as you're gonna get to Lego: The Legend of Zelda. Um, so they make this, not a hovercraft exactly, but it's very close to a hovercraft. They attach the fans to it. And now instead of taking forever to swim across this lake, he can just... No. Hover across it. I'd be curious... Like, there's obviously going to be an upper limit somewhere on how many things you can connect to one or another, but there's a pointing out here is that anything you saw in the trailer that looked like a vehicle doesn't actually exist in the world. You It was created for the trailer or they just they just stuck things together. And that, I think, is kind of the gist. They had one more that I think is going to be heavily broken. Like you can just go through the roof. Right. So you don't need to find a way to climb up the building or anything like that. You can just go through the roof. And it doesn't seem to be particular. I'm sure there's an upper height limit on how far you can go, but that's like a considerable amount. And that appears to be fine. You can go through that too. And plonk yourself out the top. So is that also a way for you to get up onto the Sky Islands? Maybe? You could climb all the way up if you want. Um, this is just pointing out that enemies also have fusible weapons. Um, and this is also showing what happens if you get knocked off uh, a Skyland. Um, it turns into Fortnite. <laughs> no, not really. But kinda. You just plummet back to the, to the bottom. There's some interesting things you can see there. Something's happened to Death Mountain. The environment has changed a little bit. There are now skylands everywhere. There's this. You can see at the top of the screen, there's some kind of relief image on, out on that field that looks like Ganon. Some things have changed, basically. Um, and you can speed your descent and obviously glide or just plop into the water. Obviously, don't do that in real life, kids. I don't know why you'd be in a position to fall off a floating island in real life, but if you were, if you fall, fall into water, it's going to kill you too. Let's just put it that way. Anyway, that's kind of it for that video. Uh, it's just a kind of intro or it's kind of a wrap up thing after that. So it's some pretty nuts mechanics being added to Tears of the Kingdom. You can see there beside Link behind him. I have a feeling that's a new... I'm not sure if they're going to be Korok puzzles in Tears of the Kingdom, but something similar. It looks like the sign might be, hey, build a build something. Build a house. Build something. Here's all the pieces you'll need to do it, and just do it. And that's the new, that's the next puzzle type. I have a feeling. Um, and you can probably kind of see over in the top left, there's a Bokoblin being carried around by some kind of flying creature. That's a, that's a new enemy type. So there's lots of... Still a lot of different things the game can show off. And also, what's going on with Link's arm? Is this actually Link? What happened to the Master Sword? and so on and so forth. So there's still a lot of things to show off there. But anyway, moving on. So, updates. So outside of Tears of the Kingdom, some other games um, had some updates, announcements and stuff like that. So this is Hollow Body, 
was announced a couple of months ago on a Kickstarter. Disclosure, I have backed on the Kickstarter. Um, Hollow Body is by a single dev. Uh, their previous game is called Chasing Static, which is a first-person horror um, walkie-talkie, walking simulator type thing, but it's very, very good. Um, Hollow Body is kind of a modern Silent Hill, kind of, so it's still going with uh, these kind of isometric camera angles. It's a very grungy filled area. This is effectively outside of future London, I think, where a lot of a lot of technology and a lot of money has gone effectively to the cities and then rural areas are really run down or abandoned entirely. Um, your character is some kind of black market smuggler who has gone out into the wilderness uh, to deliver packages and so on. And then their hover car runs out of power or malfunctions or something on the way back. They're not able to make it into the city. Um, they can't call anybody to come get them because they're not supposed to be outside the city and that kind of thing. So they're trying to fix their car, but then also horror shenanigans are going on in the background. So this is shaping up really well. Uh, I'm liking the way it's uh, turning out. It is very Silent Hill. Um, there's a combat sections a bit later that also look clunky, which is what Silent Hill was. Like, there's no, there's no change here. All right, enemies. Yeah, it's still like, even combat is still very Silent Hill. Like, uh, if anything, it's a bit better. Silent Hill's combat was very bad. Um, you're considerably more mobile than any other Silent Hill character would be, but Knowing that, the enemies are also going to be designed with that in mind, so I wouldn't necessarily keep that as a good thing. Uh, enemies will probably move a lot faster and what have you. And that's taken a lot of bullets to put down. This could be a regular enemy, this could be a boss. Don't know. Anyway, that's Hollow Body. No release date for that, just... I don't, don't, don't think there's a release date anyway. No, there's no release date. Okay. Um... Ambitious procedural detective noir Shadows of Doubt launches in April into early access on Steam. So Shadows of Doubt, um, at the last Steam Next Fest, uh, they had um, a demo out for it, and it is very, very impressive. Um, it's a procedurally generated uh, city. Lots of NPCs going about their business. There's lots of different buildings, shops, schedules for everybody, and so on. Um, and there is a bunch of different um, detective quests that are also procedurally generated. Uh, so it's effectively a detective open world game set in this kind of pixelated um, city map. Um, the demo it kind of walks you through like one of what I would imagine will be the tutorial um, case or whatever but it's like hunting down people asking questions stealthing your way into different areas that kind of thing it's got a lot of immersive sim qualities to it as well uh i was very impressed by it and i think the demo is still up if you want to give it a look but it will be hitting early access the end of this month 24th of april um i up until now i have not bought into early access just from, uh, it's my own personal stance on it, I guess. I want the game to be finished and I'll play it when it's finished kind of thing. Um, I'm seriously considering breaking that <laughs> promise for this game because it's it's really, really impressive. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see if I can manage to, to stave off from it or not. Probably not, but we'll see. Uh, Surge Devs Desert Adventure Atlas Fallen gets three months delay to August. So Atlas Fallen... Shown off previously, this is the kind of sand, sand surfing brawler type game I showed last week, maybe the week before, um, that had only just been given um, a release date of like May, but now it's suddenly been delayed to August. So I don't know, there's some weirdness going on there. Um, no other news beyond just, hey, we want more time to make it better, which is fine. There is plenty of there are plenty of other games out to play. It's like, sure, take your time with this. But it's just kind of weird they put out a trailer saying 16th of May and then not really that long after. Uh, actually, 10th of August. Sorry. Lol. Weird one. 
Okay, Luna Abyss. Um, Luna Abyss, uh, we talked about last week, and I was saying that the trailer was really atmospheric, and I was combining it, or not combining it, contrasting it with the trailer, another trailer we showed there, which was The Devil Within Satgat, which was not particularly polished, but showed off a lot of gameplay, whereas Luna Abyss was very polished, but didn't show off a lot of gameplay. Um, but now there is some gameplay for it, or potentially there already was, I'm not sure. I think the actual gameplay just skimmed right past me. But um, this was a preview put up by IGN. Um, so it does look like Luna Abyss is effectively first person Returnal. So you've got the kind of the bullet hell shenanigans that are going on in Returnal. There's no cover fire. There's no potentially no regenerative health and stuff like that. You just need to be out in the open like Doom, you know, like the older school first person shooters. Um, looks cool. And I do appreciate that the art uh, direction has maintained from the trailer. This kind of black and grey and then red accents. I really like it. So it's good that there's actual gameplay now and it is more or less what I thought it was going to be. I think I'm pretty sure it's a first person roguelike kind of thing. Anyway, looks interesting. Okay, Epic Games for this week. So on Thursday, you'll be able to pick up uh, two games actually this week for free uh, over on the Epic Games Store. You've got Blazing Sails, which is effectively Skull and Bones, but way like that game is taking a million years to come out. So you can just play it now instead. Uh, Blazing Sails Battle Royale is a Battle Royale sailing pirate thing. It's your one ship versus hundreds of other ships, not hundreds, tens, tens of other ships fight each other, you upgrade your stuff, etc, etc. I think you know, I think you get the gist of it. Um, and then Dying Light Enhanced Edition, so the original Dying Light will be available for free on Thursday of this week. Dying Light Enhanced Edition is all you need. Start your adventure in the post-apocalyptic world ruled by zombies, featuring an expansion with the buggy, your new ride, an additional game mode, two extra quarantine zones, and yada yada yada. So it's first person parkour zombies. Um, don't go out at night, though, because at night time the zombies are vampires. Okay. It just, <laughs> that's an interesting way to do it, but all right. Um, I don't know. I don't know about Dying Light. It's like Dying Light 2 see, had a lot of potential, but it took way too long to get going. And most of the good stuff was left um, way too late in the game. I just felt like... A lot of the good parkour mechanics, a lot of the good traversal mechanics and stuff like that was way too late. Um, and by the time they would have been unlocked, I was I was done with the game. Like, I'm bored. Give me the good stuff way, way earlier. Uh, Dying Light 1, I think, doesn't necessarily have that problem, but it is kind of buggy and clunky. So, I don't know, it's free. You can at least give it a shot and see what it's like. Okay, so it is the beginning of the month, which means uh, Games with Gold and PlayStation Plus um, Essential have updated. So with Games with Gold, you're getting Out of Space Couch Edition. Uh, Out of Space is kind of like Moving Out. Um, I think that's what the game is called. It's like Moving Out is like overcooked, but you're moving house instead of cooking anything. It's like... Wacky physics shenanigans, you know, you need to throw things around, things don't fit, you need to get them all into the moving van, but it's timed and wackiness ensues. Out of space is something similar, but it takes place in space. It's the kind of deal. I think there's also some kind of survival mechanic to it as well. There's no place like home, especially when you're drifting through outer space. The challenge is that a deadly alien infestation has also settled in. It will take all your strategic skills to keep each newly generated spaceship house creating resources. Okay, it's not actually what I thought it was. It's actually more of a survival sim uh, where your house, your spaceship is slowly falling apart and you just need to survive long enough to get from one destination to the next, I think is the deal. Okay. Uh, Peaky Blinders Mastermind, I think... I think is a tactics game. I've not watched any of Peaky Blinders, so no idea about characters or what have you. But I think it's like a like a co like the old Commandos games, or kind of like XCOM, but a bit more um, real time. I think that's what that is. And then PlayStation Plus, um, Meet Your Maker 
is launching directly into PlayStation Plus. So that's a brand new game coming out next or this month. Uh, Meet Your Maker is a kind of... So it's a PvP game. But the idea is you build a death trap, effectively, um, with some enticing resources in the center of it. And the other player comes in to your death trap, tries to survive it, get the resources and get out. Um, and then vice versa. You know, you can go raid their death traps and so on. Uh, so that's the kind of deal for Meteor Maker. It looks interesting. I have no interest in PvP, but I think it'd be fun to, to watch maybe more people playing it. Um, Sackboy Big Adventure is a platformer game, Mario, effectively, but Sackboy, it actually doesn't have any of the Little Big Planet uh, creative elements to it. It's just a pretty okay platform game. Uh, and then Tales of Iron, I don't know. I think it's a side scrolling Castlevania type thing. Set in the Grim Land, plagued by war, Tales of Iron is a hand drawn RPG adventure with punishingly brutal combat. As Red Gi, heir of the Rat Throne, uh, you must restore your broken kingdom by banishing the merciless Frog Clan and their ferocious leader, Greenwort. As you explore the de deceivingly charming world, you'll encounter a cast of unique companions ready to aid you in your adventure, and you'll need all the help you can get. Whether that's new and yeah, okay, so it's yeah, side scrolling, Salt and Sanctuary, um, Castlevania type thing. Cool, free. Why not? Whenever that happens, which will probably be Tuesday. Probably be soon enough. And then new releases for this week. So one game I have been uh, looking forward to for a while is Nine Years of Shadows. Uh, and every time I put it on, you know, coming up next, <laughs> probably plays a bit. Uh, Nine Years of Shadow is like the game gets delayed. And I was like, ah, why do you keep delaying it? It looks really good. I want to play it. Uh, but no, it's actually out now. It's sitting on my Steam Deck. It's like, it's no going back. I can actually play it now. Um, so Nine Years of Shadow is... Wrong button. Metroidvania type thing, or Castlevania, probably more apt. Very colorful. Um, and you have a teddy bear who can cast spells. I mean, what's what's not to like? Uh, I'm just really enjoying the, the character design, uh, the art direction, um, and some of the traversal mechanics look really interesting. Like, you can swap between... A lot of different armor types, like the earth, the earth armor lets you go through certain um, certain green blocks. The fire armor lets you kind of leap and glide, and the the water armor lets you kind of move through water and waterfalls and stuff like that. And you can just see in some of um, some of what's shown off, there's a lot of just toggling between them, which seemed really cool. It's like there on the fire one, but then also you can go green and then fire again and so on, like. That's, that's pretty cool. I think I like that. Um, that's Nine Years of Shadows. And then The Last Worker was launched today. Or not today, sorry. Uh, last week. I don't know why I said today. Um, so The Last Worker is first person, um, kind of a walking sim, walkie puzzle type thing. Um, you are the last human uh, working in what is effectively Amazon uh, fulfillment center kind of thing. Everything else is uh, robots. You're the only human working there or the final human working there or something like that. Um, I don't think it's ever said why exactly you're the only human working or why you're the only one allowed working there. Um, but it's got a pretty strong cast. Uh, it has it's compatible with PSVR 2. Um, the story is kind of interesting. It's like very anti-capitalist, but kind of told for jokes or told for laughs or something like that. Um, so yeah, we'll probably have a look at that at some stage soon. Um, but yeah, so that's The Last Worker and Nine Years of Shadows. So thus, unfortunately, that means it is now time to talk about the worst part of video games, the video game industry. So E3 wasn't cancelled, it was killed. This is a commentary from Kotaku, but this is... Um, coming off of news that E3 for 2023 has been cancelled. Um, bad news. Feels bad, man. Um, so for those somehow who you're somehow not familiar, because there hasn't been an E3 for a while now, a few years, ever since COVID at least. E3 was this big uh, industry event 
that happened during the summer in the US where a lot of video game announcements were made. Like hundreds of video game announcements would all be made. Everyone, uh, publishers, developers and so on would all congregate in LA usually uh, for a week of video game announcements, updates, press conferences and stuff like that. Um, which has largely... E3 has largely been on the downswing for a while now, pretty much ever since Nintendo stopped attending. Um, Nintendo stopped attending... I don't even think... I think it was before the Switch. Maybe even the Wii U, they stopped attending. And they started just doing uh, direct videos uh, or just releasing their own press releases and stuff like that. Um, Sony would have their own event at the same time. So it was technically not part of E3, but it was just there. They'd have their own press conference. Um, Microsoft followed suit soon after that to have their own press conference and so on. So a lot of them were distancing themselves from E3. Um, and you can kind of figure out why. So this E3 would have been a thing way before the internet. Obviously, because video games predate the internet. Um, and there needed to be a way for news to get out, you know, press releases and so on. You couldn't send an email because, remember, internet doesn't exist, so it's not a thing yet. You'd be waiting for, you know, a monthly magazine, maybe, or something like that. And if it didn't make the cut, it didn't get in. So smaller games, obviously, pretty much got zero press because there's only so much room in a magazine. Um, and the bigger games or the bigger game publishers would want a lot more space and would want a lot better coverage and so on, but they would be irked that they weren't, you know, having complete control over the whole thing. Uh, E3 as a, a trade event um, was a way to get everyone together at once um, to kind of show off all these things. It would effectively make things a bit cheaper for other developers because it would be kind of be subsidized by some of the bigger developers and stuff like that. Um, so you'd all be together on the trade floor, showing off your stuff, shouting at press, trying to get interviews, trying to get previews and things like that. It was, for the industry, a mess. Right? It was always super stressful. You weren't sure if you were really getting as much as you wanted out of it. You didn't have soup, uh, a whole lot of control over the message that was going out. And you were fighting for uh, attention from, from everybody. Um, not only that, the press would dunk on your press conferences. The W would just rip the piss out of them. Um, when the internet did come in and E3 was still a thing, E3 was shit on all the time. Like, that was the fun part. The fun part was waiting for things to go wrong on stage, and so you could rip the piss out of them. And yeah, cool, new trailers and updates, and the, yeah, that's always fun. But being able to, like, take the piss out of live press events is hilarious. Um, and that's... I haven't been able to do that for a very long time now. Um, but once... Once game publishers kind of figured out that they could just ignore E3 and just put out their own videos, their, their like pre-recorded videos, they don't even do them live anymore. Um, so like Nintendo Directs, Sony State of Play, Microsoft's Bethesda Showcase, you know, stuff like that. That was kind of the end of it for E3. Um, they've just started losing more and more people as time went on. And then the final nail in the coffin for them this week was that Ubisoft, Sega and Devolver also pulled out. So there's pretty much no big publisher there. So they decided to cancel it. Um, but yeah, that's probably it. I kind of doubt there'll be an E3 2024. This kind of feels like it's done. But um, E3 has been done before. You know, E3 has been dead <laughs> a few times now. It has been called, you know, dead because internet exists and... You can get trailers pretty easily and so on. But not only that, you can wait until there isn't a big news day and just put out your trailer then instead. You know, there's no sense in Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, EA, Ubisoft, all fighting for attention all on the same day. You know, they'll just wait. This is, you know, Sony's doing a thing. Okay, we'll wait. We'll do it next week. You know, there's no sense in us having to fight it. So for them, it's good. And for the press, it's good, too, because super stressful covering E3. There'll be hundreds of news stories coming out every day. You're having to write them up, um, get them ready to be submitted 
for, you know, onto the website that day, like 10 minutes after the news has gone live, faster even. Um, that's an incredible amount of stress to put on what we, what is usually a pretty small team that isn't paid very well, you know? It's it's, it's good for them too. Um, the only thing we're, lo- we're losing is the live press conferences, which is a shame because, as I said, ripping the piss out of them <laughs> is, is hilarious. Um, but you can always go back and watch the old ones, I suppose. Anyway, E3 may or may not be dead, but it is cancelled for this year. Okay, some Bobby news. Activision CEO Bobby Kotick responds to disappointing Sony behavior. So this is news. Bobby put out an email to staff. Uh, sent an email to staff saying Sony's behavior is disappointing, but won't affect the long-term relationship because money. Um, so just in case the Microsoft Activision deal doesn't go through, I mean, it almost certainly will. Really? But just in case it doesn't, I guess. They still want to be somewhat friendly with Sony. Um, I just picked out this one particular part of the quote because it's just disgusting. But anyway, all of us who work so hard to deliver the best games in our industry care too deeply about our players to ever launch subpar versions of our games. Bobby, who are you in this sentence? Which part of it are you? You're not... You certainly don't work hard. You certainly don't deliver the best games in the industry. And you certainly don't care deeply about the players. So... Ever launch subpar versions of our games. The incredible amount of... Gaslighting. Has Activision ever had best game in our industry? Has it ever won a game of the year? Sekiro, maybe? And even then, it was just a publisher? It wasn't a developer. I'd have to check, but I don't think so. I don't think Activision have ever had a game of the year. So best game in our industry? Mmm, don't think so. Most played, maybe. Like, give it that. But best? PlayStation players know we will continue to deliver the best games possible on Sony platforms. <laughs> The best games possible on Sony platforms coming from Activision. We need a study done on that one, I think. That's I don't know, I think we need some data on that one, Bobby. Anyway, this is just Bobby saying, yeah, whatever. Sony are trying to squash the deal, and from Bobby's point of view, it's like, no, I want the payday. I I want my big buyout from Microsoft. I want all that money. Stop getting in the way, but just in case it doesn't go through, hey, we're still friends though, you can still you can still sell games on your platform though, yeah? <laughs> hmm. Sticking with Bobby though, um, so Activision Blizzard may have pulled out of China over messy miscommunication. So this is kind of some news from the fallout between Activision Blizzard China and NetEase, who were their publisher in China. Um, so last November, uh, Activision Blizzard suddenly ended its partnership with NetEase. You may remember there was this news story where one of the one of the um, negotiators with NetEase said, "This deal that we've had in place for years is going to fall apart because of some jerk." That was a direct quote. It was just some jerk. Um, it's possible the some jerk is big shock, everybody. Everybody. Freudian slip. Big shock, everybody. It's Bobby Kotick. Uh, Netty suggested it could sway Chinese regulators on Microsoft's plan acquisition of Activision. A statement Netty says was intended as a conciliatory gesture, but that Activision executives interpreted as a threat. The two companies ended the partnership a month later. So, the breakdown of it is the two of them, Netty and Activision, were negotiating contract, renewal of the contract. It was supposed to be a kind of rubber stamp effectively since because of Chinese regulations Activision can't directly sell their games in China they have to be sold through a Chinese company so NetEase was the Chinese company for that um, situation Uh, NetEase chief executive William Ding wanted their companies to switch to a licensing deal rather than a distribution based relationship because it made better financial uh, sense for them um, Bobby seemed open to the idea, but he was concerned that a licensing deal would affect regulatory talks around the Microsoft acquisition. Uh, Ding told Kodak that NetEase could sway the Chinese government to either prevent or allow the Microsoft acquisition. Now, a way to read this, there's two ways you can read it. One way you can read it is what NetEase is suggesting was the intent behind it, which is, don't worry about that. 
NetEase will will smooth that over. You don't need to worry about regulations. We can do it. Oh, you know, we have we have a lot of pull with the Chinese government because we're a big company or something like that. Um, and the other way to read it, which is the way Activision read it, was, um, "Hey, this is a this is a nice company you got here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it." Um, you know, kind of a mob mentality type of thing. And that is how um, Activision took it. Uh, Microsoft would have to deal with Chinese regulatory laws if it did not offload Activision Blizzard's properties uh, to NetEase. Um, so that's the kind of issue there, is that NetEase kind of hold a lot of the reins for Activision's business in China. Um, just the way Chinese regulations around video games are going is that you can either sell your games through a Chinese subsidiary and you won't incur massive regulatory fines, or yeah, you can sell it directly if you want, but massive fees to do so. Um, anyway, Times claims that, this is the New York Times, claimed that Activision executives felt that NetEase had threatened Kodak. Not threatened the company, threatened Bobby specifically. Now, nothing in that statement, to me, at least. So the statement is not even a statement, I guess. This is more of a summation of it, but... Uh, NetEase could sway the Chinese government to either prevent or allow the Microsoft acquisition. In what way is that a threat towards Bobby? Even if you're reading the kind of mob um, intimidation tactic version, it's not towards Bobby, it's towards Activision, the company. Unless, you know, Bobby is a bit, maybe a little bit narcissistic and sees the company and himself as one and the same. Mm, yeah, it could be that one. It's probably that one, really. Anyway, uh, Activision offered NetEase the licensing deal if the company paid $500 million up front as a means of offsetting the cost of regulatory complications, to which NetEase said, fuck off. Uh, NetEase reportedly rejected the offer, calling it commercially illogical, like... We're moving through this deal to make more money, not lose money. Um, anyway. And the final statement from NetEase is, It is unfortunate that Activision Blizzard continues to harass and taunt companies and regulators worldwide, making unfounded accusations to distract everyone from its real problems. So this unfounded accusation is that they threatened Activision with... Or they threatened to scupper the deal, basically, with China. Um, and the harassment and taunting is the 500 million fuck you, effectively. Our recent negotiations revealed a clear misalignment between the two companies, both in commercial terms and in corporate values. Therefore, we decided it was not in our long-term interest to serve the short-term goals of Activision Blizzard's current leadership or to deviate from our founding principles. You hear that, Bobby? You're short-term. You're a short-term goal kind of guy. So the immediate fallout with that was, of course, um, Overwatch, World of Warcraft, etc. Um, all got pulled from China. Um, people who had bought it couldn't play it anymore. Um, and then people who had, you know, built up friendships around World of Warcraft or Overwatch or anything like that are effectively scuppered. So it's pretty shit. It's pretty shit uh, turn of events. But yeah, big shock. The some jerk who ruins um, this business deal between Activision Blizzard and Netties was Bobby. Of course it was. Anyway, uh, Team 17 CEO Debbie Bestwick to step down. She will remain in the UK firm in a non-executive role once her successor has been found. So Team 17, you may know uh, they're the developer behind uh, Worms. Uh, but they also publish a bunch of indie titles. So I kind of only wanted to bring this up because all the articles that I saw or read about uh, Debbie Bestwick stepping down from the CEO position don't bring up um, the accusations made by employees who work at Team 17 about crunch, about um, her, her, her harassment and bullying of her employees, of her flaunting her wealth, of her making like 10, like millions in profit while uh, employee salaries were cut because of um, economic downturn around COVID and stuff like that. There's no mention of it anywhere. I even had to go back and make sure that I, this is her, right? I was like, I, like, I know this name. I know I've re I read that about her. I had to go back and look at my older video 
about it. It's like, why is nobody mentioning it? It's not mentioned. Games Industry don't mention it. Eurogamer don't mention it. Video Games Chronicle don't mention it. I was like, okay, this is a surprise. Nobody mentioned anything about this. But anyway, she's stepping down. Um, they eventually have a, a team that will oversee some things while they look for the new CEO. There's no mention of why exactly she's stepping down. She's kind of giving the diplomatic politician's answer of, I want to spend more time with my kids, which is usually code for I was forced out. There's no answer around that. But anyway, I just found it odd that nobody nobody talked about it. Anyway. Uh, Ubisoft Paris developers speak of morally and physically exhausting crunch culture in new reports. It was It was effectively a story exactly like this. But about Team 17, six months ago. Anyway, this time it's about Ubisoft Paris. So developers have spoken about morally, physically exhausting crunch culture at Ubisoft Paris. Um, this is a development team behind Just Dance. Uh, Solidaires Informatique, the union group, said the pre-production of the game was a mess. Um, the team was tasked with changing the Just Dance 2023 engine just 11 months before launch, which is insane. That is not when you change the game's engine. You change your game's engine before you even start development. Uh, bosses continued to push ideas that had to be considered at all costs. Um, and the developers say, despite all of that, they were already underwater uh, before dropping these things on, on top of them. So, so far, mismanagement, hugely. This is uh, higher ups not being able to hear no. Uh, not being able to hear no from the people who have to do the thing. Say, hey, I want to do this. It's impossible. I don't want to hear impossible. It's like, I am the guy you hired with the technical knowledge for these things, and I am telling you it can't be done. Why'd you bother hiring me? Like, honestly. Once the creative vision is clear, it is presented to technical experts and often impossible to achieve. Uh, either they have no choice but to achieve the impossible, and you can't achieve the impossible, so what you're getting is a subpar version of what you actually wanted, or we are forced to change everything. So this is swapping out the engine, effectively, because... The thing they wanted them to do would be impossible with their current engine. Okay, change the engine. It's, we're launching in like the end of the year. This is a terrible idea. Anyway, this is both morally and physically exhausting for the employees. Uh, several employees had to deal with late strategic decisions from those higher ups, i.e. changing the fucking engine. Uh, said it would hire more workers and would not push paid overtime, but this promise was not kept. Uh, overtime at Ubisoft Paris was reportedly began as a control system, so we'll just do it a little bit. You know, just to see if we can catch up on, you know, some work. But as time passed, it became commonplace and a double standard was established. Effectively, developers got to work overtime, but not managers. That's what that's what that double standard is. Uh, Ubisoft employees work from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And this is all working on Just Dance. Just, just keep that in mind. A game nobody plays. <laughs> I mean, some obviously somebody plays. They wouldn't keep making it, but... Who the fuck talks about playing Just Dance? Anyway, uh, work from 9am to 10pm. QA testers, on the other hand, work 10am to midnight, if not longer. This is once again QA getting shit on. If you're wondering why all of the video game unions, video game industry unions, are all QA for some reason, you know why. They're the ones who get shit on the most, basically. During daily meetings, some employees were explicitly encouraged to work overtime. Uh, the message was clear. Make overtime work. Um... All of the problems with Ubisoft Paris reportedly came from Ubisoft HQ. Big shock there. Uh, they want us to be the first game as a service and big live game of Ubisoft's portfolio. We showed them a realistic roadmap to realize this and they refused. So this is once again not being able to hear no. This is dictatorial rather than... Um, fuck's sake. Where you work together. I can't think of the word. Anyway, um, Just Dance 2023 team was given enough time to learn the new engine. Sorry, wasn't given enough time to learn the new engine. The report notes that workers were able to learn quickly, but this was then used as a reason to add more features. Yeah, this is no good deed. Goes unpunished as usual. So big shock, you know, a developer for a big publisher uh, experiences crunch. Like... These kind of reports, we have read a few of them now, and they're all by different publishers, you know? Ubisoft already has a bad track record 
for its uh, sexual harassment, for its undermining of union efforts, for its just general toxic workplace. Uh, having this news, even coming from a game that's kind of seen as like a party fun time game that doesn't take itself very seriously and it's still has this shit, you know, like things are changing. You are getting unionization happening slowly. But this is Ubisoft Paris, you know, France. France are f like famously drop of a hat, <laughs> you know, protests. And even at that, they're managing to do it. Um, it's just disappointing and kind of demoralizing. Like I don't work, obviously I don't work for them. You know, I don't know anybody who works there, but I can still feel like you should be treated a lot better to be working on fucking Just Dance. 2023 and still be expected to do ridiculous crunch in overtime while management gets away with it and makes like a six figure salary like it's just extremely enraging anyway that's it for industry bullshit so we'll try to finish off with something light i guess like the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog, maybe. Sega has released a surprise Sonic murder mystery game for free. So this was an April Fool's Day joke um, that is actually a fully, like, fully functioning game. It's a murder mystery where Sonic the Hedgehog has been murdered and you need to figure out who did it. Uh, so the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog is available now on Steam. Uh, it's a point and click visual novel, kind of Danganronpa kind of thing, but without the walking around part. Um, it's Amy Rose's birthday, and she's hosting a murder mystery party on the Mirage Express. Uh, when Sonic the Hedgehog becomes the game's victim, everyone is off to get to the bottom of things. However, something feels a bit off. Is this really an innocent game, or is something more sinister afoot? So, it's a murder mystery game type thing. Like, even in-universe, it's a game, like a dinner party kind of thing. Uh, where you all try to solve a mystery. So, try to solve a murder mystery, and but it's Sonic who's dead. Uh, <laughs> He might actually, for reals, be dead, though. <laughs> Which is just hilarious. I just, like, there was a tweet that went out before the game was announced. Um, where it's like, we were taking Sonic the Hedgehog in a new direction. I said, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty new, all right. It's a pretty new direction. This was pretty funny. Um, I have it installed. I haven't got around to playing it yet, but I think it will be pre <laughs> pretty dumb. Anyway, um... I'll leave Nine Years of Shadows uh, to play in the background. So, that was the news from April... I did that very wrong. It's only April 2nd today to March something. Whatever I said at the beginning was wrong. Anyway. Um, you should loop. Right, so you're too long didn't watch... Um, Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, really interesting video. It's effectively become Lego, The Legend of Zelda. Um, Hollow Body, really interesting uh, exploration of combat video showing off. Looks like Silent Hill. Um, Shadows of Doubt is coming to Steam Early Access at the end of this month. It's a procedurally generated open world detective game. Give it a look. Um, Atlas Fallen, delayed into August. Um, Fuck, what were the other things? I can't remember. All right, skipping ahead. Uh, monthly games, they're out, or they're, no, they will be out. Uh, Xbox Games with Gold, PlayStation Plus, uh, Essential uh, will be updated this week. Um, new releases, uh, Nine Years of Shadows that you can see on screen right now uh, is a um, Castlevania type thing that's very colorful and looks really cool. Also, The Last Worker, which is a first person, really well voice acted game where you are the last human worker in a robot fulfillment warehouse center kind of thing. Um, industry bullshit. E3 2023 cancelled. Might be dead forever. Um, Bobby Kotick still wants to keep good relations with Sony even though they keep trying to squash the Microsoft deal. Um, Microsoft Netty's de decision fell apart because Bobby is a child. Um, Ubisoft. Ubisoft Paris crunch because of Just Dance 2023 for some reason. Um, even though the reason is obvious, it's because shitty management. Uh, Debbie Westwick, Team 17, CEO, stepping down. Nobody mentioned that she was probably not a great person to work with. Um, and Sega killed Sonic the Hedgehog, for real, officially, for some reason. Right, moving back 
to uh, channel news. So what is happening on the channel this week and last week? You know what, I'll just come out of full screen so I can see where I'm supposed to go. Okay, so uh, some kind of admin stuff and some changes since uh, we went affiliate. So I have, this will kind of only affect people who hang out on the YouTube channel. Um, I'm changing the thumbnails. Um, so I've updated them a little bit now. Um, I was working with art guy, Phil Dragash, who's done a lot of art for the channel previously. So he helped me kind of put these thumbnails together. Um, they're going to still look kind of similar to the ones that we already had. You know, we've got uh, the name of the game series on one side, uh, the name of the game we're looking at, and then some key art from it on the opposite side. So it's kind of the same thumbnails we already have. Uh, but I have different logos now for the different series. So we have Foley Plays, which is our usual Let's Play series. We'll have Foley Fables, which is our narrative-focused games Let's Plays. Foley Plays a bit. Instead of Foley Plays for a bit, it's just going to be Foley Plays a bit. Um, and those are early game impressions for newly released titles, like Canna Quest here. Um, and then there's a couple of other ones, but we will go over them uh, in the future. So you're looking at these. Um, you might see kind of the square corner thing uh, and a rounded corner thing. YouTube right now rounds their thumbnails. So when you see that on YouTube, you won't see the square angular corner. You'll see a rounded corner. Anyway, you'll see them popping up. Um, the, for the Let's Plays that are currently still on, I'm going to keep the old style until they're finished. But once they're finished, any new Let's Play is going to use the new um, the new layout. Um, emotes. Uh, again, Phil is working on emotes for us at the moment. This was a kind of rough sketch he sent me. He was like, which, which art style do you want? Um, so I had asked him to kind of put together a couple of reactions of a chibi version of myself kind of thing. Um, this is just an example one for lol. Um, it's like, which one do you want? One, two, or three? Um, and I had said that my preference is one, three, two. Uh, so that's the order that I th I'm going to go in. So we're going to try to make them, um, for the most part, use the design in the first panel. Um, and for ones that it won't really work for, we'll use the design in the third panel. And if we still can't find anything that works for it, we'll use the design in the second panel. Um, that's the deal with that. Um, also out on the channel, you might notice that the, the, the layout is a little bit different now. Um, so I'm using stream elements. Uh, we have chat on one side. Uh, we have some kind of thumbnail updates and stuff down at the bottom. You've got questions there if you want, you know, what's the next game you want to see on fully, uh, plays for a bit or a bit. I still have to get used to that myself. Um, you know? Uh, if you have a suggestion, there's a suggestion box over on Twitch. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just drop it in the comments for what you think should be the next one. Um, also, there are now sound alerts uh, available on the channel. So if I can trigger them from here. Now, you won't hear these on YouTube, but you will hear them on... Um, You should hear them on um, Twitch. So I can play that. It'll play the Final Fantasy XIV fanfare. So that's the kind of thing we're going for. You can access all of them down where the channel points are um, for various amounts of monies and so on. Or not monies, various amounts of channel points. Channel points are free. You just got to watch. You'll accrue them over time. So some change, things are changing around on the channel. Um, and I am introducing more features that I can get away with now because we're affiliates, but that's the kind of deal. And so some other things will change over time, but that's kind of, it's kind of what we're going with right now. Um, anyway, this is our game roadmap for the first six months of 2023. Um, so quick, uh, explanation, uh, these are all the games we are planning to feature on the channel between the beginning of this year and the middle of this year. So the end of June, um, all these games, these little symbols that are in the bottom corners, um, the green tick means it has been featured on the channel already. Uh, a yellow dot means it's currently in progress on the channel. A gray clock means it's on its way. It'll be pretty soon. If there's no symbol. It'll be on the channel at some point, we just haven't decided when. 
Um, and if there's a little golden wedge in the top left corner, it means it is a full Let's Play. If it's not there, it is probably just a one-shot video. So you can see in the top right corner, there's a blank space now. That is where Atlas Fallen was was up until it got delayed into August, which is obviously after June. So there's space for me to add something there, but I haven't added it yet. Um, so this week we played Canna Quest and also Storyteller, but I forgot to put a trailer in for that. But Canna Quest um, was actually a sponsored stream. Uh, Whitethorn Games gave me a key uh, to check it out. Canna Quest is a game, it's a puzzle sliding um, tile game that attempts to kind of teach you how to recognize and pronounce hiragana and katakana, which are the kind of phonetic pronunciation for Japanese words. Um, so it does this by just giving you different puzzles. Um, certain, certain hiragana and katakana can only be beside one or the other, so they have to either match the consonant or they have to match the vowel, and that's kind of how the kind of game works. That's how the puzzles work. We played kind of the very early starting parts to it, which is kind of only really um, starting to get complicated. Um, like a lot of the stuff I just saw in the trailer, like we didn't see any of it. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I was starting to kind of recognize the symbols instead of having to check. You can, you can flip the tile over and see what it's supposed to be. Um, but I was eventually being able to see, hey, this is... You know, I already know what that is. I don't need to flip it over. So it is kind of working. Um, but I guess it's something you just have to do a lot of. Um, we'll get to Resident Evil 4 in a second. We also played Storyteller on Friday, which is a... Storytelling a puzzle game where you have characters and scenarios and then the game will give you a one-sentence story, which is like... Um, a tragedy occurs or something like that and you just need to put different scenarios and different characters together to make a tragedy happen or something like that. Um, it's really well presented um, and I really like the art style and I really like, just like the feeling of moving the different tiles around to have your different story play out. Um, it was supposed to be an impression video but it turned into a full let's play because the game's kind of short. Uh, I think we finished it in less than two hours, so... Like, I wouldn't... I'm not somebody who says that game has to be a certain amount of time long. Like, if you had fun with it, and you enjoyed your time with it, I think that's good enough. Um, and I did have fun with it, and I did enjoy my time with it, but God, I, wish it, I was just wish it was a little bit longer. Like, I think it could do it another three chapters or so. Or maybe each chapter should have more um, more scenarios in it. Because I think it has the same kind of issue that Case of the Golden Idol had. In that the first couple of puzzles are simple. Because they're explaining the concept to you through playing it. Um, so the first like one or two chapters in the Case of the Golden Idol are kind of basic. Because they're just kind of tutorial levels. And Storyteller is much the same. You know, like the first chapter is kind of a tutorial and the game is short enough that you kind of get the feeling that you should get into the more complicated ones faster, if that's the case, or make the game longer, I guess is the other way around. Anyway, um, we also played uh, or continued more entries in our currently ongoing Let's Plays and they will be continuing into next week. So next week, um, Resident Evil 4 Remake. Uh, we'll be continuing into that. We played on Monday of this week, but we did not play yesterday because I was very tired. And I'm still, honestly, kind of very tired. Um, but we have found Ashley at the very end of Monday's stream. So we'll be continuing on from that point. Um, Sherlock Holmes, Chapter 1. Um, we have once again inflicted childhood trauma on Sherlock. Um, but with then we spent most of this week's entry kind of doing side quests side quests and side puzzles that were a bit lengthier than i was expecting them to be so i thought we might get a bit more of a story chapter in but it didn't quite work out that way um so this week's entry will be story focused instead and then um 
Breath of the Wild, we went after the three dragons for this chapter, or for this week's, last week's entry. Uh, so the three dragons, Farosh, uh, Dinral, and Nadra, uh, that are all associated with the, the Triforce. So it's a dragon of wisdom, courage, strength, and so on. They have different shrine quests associated with them. Um, so they were fun. They're all kind of different uh, or require kind of different things for, things for you to do. Um, so this week, uh, I'm probably going to do the Champion's Ballad DLC. That's the plan, anyway. Um, and if we get through that, we'll take a shot at the Trial of the Sword DLC. Um, and I imagine that will probably carry us into the week after as well, because it's fairly lengthy and fairly difficult. Uh, and yes, we are very much putting off finishing the game. But we will have to finish it before um, Tears of the Kingdom comes out. But that is the plan uh, for next week. So that's our schedule. So Monday, Resident Evil 4 uh, remake. Wednesday, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1. Thursday, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. No stream on Friday because I'll be playing D&D. And Saturday, hopefully again, I won't be super tired and we'll play Resident Evil 4 remake. And then Sunday, we'll be right back around to the weekly news recap. Right. That's your news, and that's your channel update for today. I'm going to head off and do something. I don't know. I'm still re I, Honestly, I might go back to bed. I'm very tired. Uh, anyway, we'll see you guys tomorrow uh, for Resi 4 Remake. And again, if you do have a suggestion under my face uh, for the next game, it doesn't have to be the ones I'm showing there. If you have your own suggestion, let me know. Um, otherwise, you won't see it. If you want a game, I'll play it. Maybe, if I have it. I have a lot of games. It's entirely possible I do. Um, anyway, see you guys on Monday. Bye bye. Thank you.